The Strawberry Switchblade was popular in the UK, Scotland, and Japan. This will be important later. This will be important later. They were really only exceptionally popular in the UK and Japan. The only girls in the 1980s music business whose fashion sense and taste of makeup could match the boys of the era. Strawberry Switchblade then, or SSB, requires an introduction for anyone who does not have a nostalgic taste for them, anyone who is not a cult internet fan, or anyone who does not live on an island. The two, Rose McDowell and Jill Bryson, being the mixed product of Glasgow's post-punk scene mixed with the certain dark, new romantic, neo-Victorian fashion sense of the 1980s. Bryson being an art student who had never actually played an instrument before the band, and McDowell, who worked at a cake shop, being an on-again, off-again musician fascinated by punk music and magic. The band's associates would, in retrospect, call their appeal Sinister Sweet, with maybe an element of sadism, the gothic aspect. Strawberry Switchblade's sound ended up being the definition of 1980s synth-pop, with their defining global hit being the sardonic Since Yesterday. The group existed for an uneven whiplash of five to six years, made a polka dot on fashion, then was unfortunately relegated by the music press to being one of those where are they now one-hit wonders, which they weren't. Bizarrely, Strawberry Switchblade's obituary, the band's, is more interesting than its career. Strawberry Switchblade is one of those groups that is slash was more popular abroad rather than at home, though McDowell, as a musician, saw more success as a sort of musician's musician post-Strawberry Switchblade. SSB, though, saw the same sort of pseudo-pop success that the Kelly family saw in Europe, David Hasselhoff saw in Germany, and the Irish girl group The Nolans saw in Japan. Americans do not know who the Kelly family is, David Hasselhoff is David Hasselhoff, and the Nolans, outside Japan, are paradoxically known for being popular in Japan for being popular in Japan, because they're popular in Japan. Unsurprisingly, the country Strawberry Switchblade persisted in best was Japan too, probably better than their native Scotland until recently. Strawberry Switchblade's music was not only popular in Japan, their clothes were popular in Japan, and even one of their producers, David Motion, ended up being popular in Japan as well. So why is the sinister sweet taste of Strawberry Switchblade so well remembered? A bit of bitter almonds. Beside that one pop hit, since yesterday, Strawberry Switchblade has largely been a cult band, but it has had its history laid out plenty of times. The background is equally cultic, or maybe punkic. The group directly grew out of the Scottish post-punk scene in Glasgow, the city's depressing nature in the 1970s and 1980s inspiring Strawberry Switchblade's aesthetic response. McDowell's first band, The Poems, 1981, being formed in direct response to a particularly impactful Ramones performance she saw. Little Punks was the term McDowell would later use for their social circles at the time, McDowell and Bryson having direct and indirect links to many popular and later influential acts connected to the region, the New Sonics, later renamed Orange Juice, Aztec Camera, Simple Minds, the Bluebells, the Pastels, and later indirectly connected to English groups such as Echo and the Bunnymen and the Weather Prophets through labels. The name Strawberry Switchblade itself, though, had a complicated history even before the duo. It could even be said the name Strawberry Switchblade created the band, and not the band who created the name. James Kirk, guitarist of Orange Juice, took it from the psychedelic band Strawberry Alarm Clock. Inspired by the name, he created Strawberry Switchblade. Strawberry Switchblade was at one point the title of a song, then was intended as the title of a fanzine for Orange Juice, very 1980s, then through Bryson's then-boyfriend photographer Peter MacArthur, a band companion, ended up in the hands of Rose McDowell and Jill Bryson, who had met in 1977. The name, and Orange Juice's influence, according to Bryson, being why they formed Strawberry Switchblade at all. As she stated back in the 2000s, knowing Orange Juice in that lot, because I live nearby, they were just like, oh yeah, you should be in a band, you should do this, you can do demos with us. Strawberry Switchblade officially started, very briefly, as a quartet in 1981-1982, a female four-piece. The only real artifact of this era is the Spanish song demos, which were basically lost for years until they turned up. The other two members were Janice Goodlett, bass, and Kale McGowan, drums, 
associates slash alumni from the Glasgow School of Art, but both Goodlett and McGowan left therefore rendering the band a duo of Bryson and McDowell. It would stay this way until it dissolved in 1985-1986. Jill Bryson then had the fashion sense, and McDowell the music. The combined initiative resulted in that sinister sweet impression. Like the name, the look of Strawberry's Switchblade existed before the band. Tailoring handmade dresses and outfits, which were a medley of Victorian outfits, 1950s skirts, and flamenco dresses hoarded from thrift shops. The two were already famous around Glasgow for their iconic polka dot doll fashion sense prior to Strawberry Switchblade. Bryson was a student of mixed media at Glasgow School of Art, and McDowell worked at a cake shop slash bakery. Both backgrounds, and a love of fairies and magic, contributed to the aesthetics. It could only become more ostentatious, though it seemed to have been McDowell who followed after Bryson in regards to fashion at the start of Strawberry Switchblade. By the end of the band, McDowell was dressing in PVC. Interestingly, Bryson's interests as an artist was not in the gothic, Victorian, or romantic, but in pop art, mainly British pop art. Peter Blake, R.B. Kadai, and Patrick Colefield. Though her main influence has always been English painter David Hockney and his simple bright colors. One thing to keep in mind would have been the contrast of 1970s 1980s Scotland, the era of Cole Not Dole, and that bright style. The stark contrast in Scotland was doubtless influential in the gothic romantic element of Strawberry Switchblade, so hiding colors, the polka dot obsession. The look was pretty much right there from the beginning. We had a real aesthetic going, we'd buy 50 style dresses with full skirts from secondhand shops, and they'd often have polka dot designs. We also loved Spanish dolls. Rose managed to find a flamenco dress, which looked amazing, I think it was a child size in Patty's Market. I got a loan of a sewing machine and make my own clothes with fabric bought from Remnant Kings and Mandors, next to Glasgow School of Art. By the time we decided to form a band, while our look got us noticed, it never detracted from the songs. This will be important later. Rose McDowell then had the music. McDowell, as already said, was in the short-lived band The Poems as the drummer. Both in Strawberry Switchblade, though, had no guitar experience prior to forming the duo. Bryson actually had no music experience, period, as an art student. She learned how to play guitar from a 1957 edition of Play in a Day. McDowell bought herself a 12-string guitar and taught herself how to play chords. She was going to do rhythm guitar and the frilly bits, as she described it. Then Bryson would be the guitarist and singer. That was the plan, anyway. It didn't really end up happening. Most of the original songs were partially put together by Bryson singing a melody on a cassette tape, then giving it to McDowell to write lyrics. Strawberry Switchblade's music was a particular chameleon, though, evolving a lot in the short time the band existed, major influences being the Velvet Underground's Sunday Morning, which the band covered, and Patti Smith. One could even argue for roots as widespread as William Morris, the Bronte sisters, Elizabeth Browning, and Robert Burns for the themes in Strawberry Switchblade's lyrics. By the time the two actually reached the studio for the album, it was Saturday morning pop, but the structure was particularly derived from post-punk and genres that would later be called things like dark wave and, in other parts of the world, neo-acoustic. All the songs were awash with melancholic yearning and bemusement at the world, usually dark bemusement. Their lyrics were filled with spoonfuls of wistful ennui or melancholy. It was probably also due to the Scottish background. Bryson suffered from periods of agoraphobia, which left her depressed and panicked. McDowell had spent her turbulent childhood in what Bryson described as a deprived, somewhat violent area in Scottish council housing. Their dynamic. Jill liked her cats, and Rose liked collecting weapons. It was an interesting relationship. Bryson's favorite bands were The Undertones, Pastels, Madness, and Velvet Underground. Then McDowell liked Stephen Pastel, Maureen Tucker, Edwin Collins, Johnny Cash, and Genesis P. Orridge. As McDowell said herself, I'd love somebody to one day say, oh it's music to kill yourself to, but I love melody and the beauty of melancholy. Music video director Tim Pope has mentioned, in his words, there was a very David Lynchy element of Strawberry Switchblade that guaranteed their cultic post-popularity, an element he attempted to emphasize in his music videos for the band, taking influence from things like Eraserhead and other arthouse movies. 
This, though, created a clash between the executives who saw SSB as a band for little girls and the actual band who liked their indie people from Glasgow. They could market the look, but then the actual contents of the band were, well, for example, McDowell enjoyed messing with vapid interviewers by answering very boring questions with outlandish answers. When asked if she identified with any characters from history, McDowell insisted she admired the notorious outlaw Sonny Bean, leader of the legendary Scottish Highland clan who were said to waylay travelers and then cannibalize them. Cannibalism was not an easy sell to teeny bobbers. But Bryson and McDowell clearly enjoyed the joke. McDowell more so. The highlight of this identity confusion was Strawberry Switchblade's contributions to famous composer David Bedford's Rigel 9, 1985, a space opera album written by author Ursula K. Le Guin. Strawberry Switchblade were brought onto the album to provide the voices for the alien funeral leaders. It was an interesting feature, all things considered. McDowell ultimately asserted that they were intended as almost a parody of a pop band. Because, although we were doing pretty well and we were quite happy doing what we were doing, we weren't quite straight enough for a lot of people who were watching. People would watch it because it was interesting. It looked kind of cartoony and fun. That will be important later. The end of Strawberry Switchblade is generally associated with the 1985 single Jolene, the band's fifth and final single. Well, it's complicated. Though the duo would not truly dissolve until 1986. Yes, this is a Strawberry Switchblade synth-pop 1980s cover of Dolly Parton's Jolene. Produced as a sincere tribute to Dolly Parton, as Strawberry Switchblade admired her, though, as is obvious, there was an intended sardonic swipe at the record executives pigeonholing Strawberry Switchblade as a mere girls band prior to this. Infamously, a scene of McDowell cage dancing in her PVC was cut for being too shocking for airwaves in 1985. The cover, though, is not as bad as one would think, thanks to the harmonica by Larry Adler. It was the perfect embodiment of country emo psychedelic, which Rose and McDowell's later career would follow. The song slash music video, in retrospect, represented everything that was destroying Strawberry Switchblade, though. Issues with the record company, lack of follow-up hits, no funding due to said lack of hits and band issues, Lack of privacy due to the press, executives, stalkers, Bryson's agoraphobia and a desire to return to art, McDowell's depressive dislike of the fickle nature of the pop music business, personal issues, and a divide between McDowell and Bryson that was putting them at such ends they could barely work together on the second album. A second album that was already seeing dim prospects of ever being released. Being a pop band required generating hits, which Strawberry Switchblade was never intended for as an indie people band for little punks. Strawberry Switchblade, due to its origins, was never intended as a band that wanted to generate hits to enter the top 100. One thing both Jill Bryson and Rose McDowell agreed upon about the end of the band, it was over because it was not much fun anymore. Jill Bryson described the inevitable end of the band. By that point, we weren't really writing together. We did start working on a second album, but things had become very difficult. They said, why don't we have one side with Rose on it and you on the other? By that point, what was the purpose of the band? The Strawberry Switchblade dissolved in obscurity, but that is technically incorrect, though it's also correct. Jill Bryson would go on to be a very successful artist, working in paints and stained glass. She enjoyed her time in the band. Technically, McDowell did use the Strawberry Switchblade name a few times after the end of the original band slash duo, but that seemed more due to convenience than any intent to continue the original concept. The original duo have more or less spoken of very little since the end of the original band. Rose McDowell would remain in the peripheries of the music business, but she was not really marginalized. She would, though, go in the absolute opposite direction of what the executives wanted Strawberry Switchblade to be. Collaborating with parts of Throbbing Gristle, Psychic TV, Current 93, Death in June, Boyd Rice, and Kukul? Kukul? Yes, that means there's a Rose McDowell Bjork connection. And a McDowell Thomas Legati connection. There's even a David Tibet cover of Since Yesterday for the, well, you know who you are. Odd, and even controversial in more than one case, but doubtlessly influential on the margins. Though sadly not much remarked upon. But the people who like it, like it. So was Strawberry Switchblade, as a band, indie or pop? Well, pop, but post-punk wearing the skin of pop music. 
Some sources suggest John Deacon of Queen was even attached to the 1985 album, but that seems not to be true, or his contributions were incredibly marginal. It is, though, a definitively 1980s album due to producer David Motion, who even admits this, but that is not a good or a bad thing here. Also to note are the production contributions by David Balfe and Bill Drummond. Motion, for example, famously sampled Jean Sibelius' Symphony No. 5 for the opening of Since Yesterday. Hey wait, did I not just talk about that fin- Honestly, Since Yesterday's classical elements contributed greatly to development of synth-pop and later synth-wave, while also being a backhand parody of pop songs, la 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 la, then still openly engaging with lyrics like, it's so clear that all we have now are our thoughts of yesterday. Strawberry Switchblade's first hit, and only hit really, was openly foreshadowing the duo's demise. McDowell later clarified it was actually about nuclear war though. Oddly appropriate. Others like the eerie Deep Water saw the strongest contributions by David Motion on the production side, the song being glittery and crystalline, but can also be interpreted as suicidal idealization or attachment to any form of addiction, destructive or not. Why can't we go back there now? You could take my hand, and we could go back like before. Once again, all these songs sound incredibly 1980s. That's not a good or a bad thing, these just aren't hard rockers. Another Day falls victim to this where the vocals excel the actual music. The song sounds like a rejected Yellow Magic Orchestra tune, a group Motion was heavily inspired by at the time. This will be important later. The reverse of this is the following Little River, which sonically and lyrically is still very depressive, but in a good way. One reason Strawberry Switchblade has that gothic appeal. Other songs like 10 James Orr Street were written by McDowell by taking scenes from her life. I want to stay here. This could be my home forever. But you say I can't come back ever. You don't know just how much I wish I could stay in this house forever. One could easily interpret this figuratively, but McDowell has said it was purposely written about a council house her family was relocated from when she was very young. Same for Trees and Flowers, which Bryson wrote about her agoraphobia with some beautifully stark lyrics. Shades of the Lady of Shallot, mixed with the experience of serious psychological suffering. Other songs such as By the Sea were apparently a collaboration between the duo through and through. Conjecture here. But I believe Who Knows What Love Is and Go Away and other songs from the album were influential on Japanese pop and ambient music. Part of that is that David Motion was inspired by Yellow Magic Orchestra and Ryuichi Sakamoto, but it goes a little deeper. Go Away strings bring to mind OSTs as distant as Kingdom Hearts. Compare Go Away to the title screen music from Kingdom Hearts for example, or even another RPG soundtrack like the Dark Cloud series. Other songs like Being Cold also laid out a very stirring model of how to merge classical, ambient, and synthesized sounds. David Motion, Jill Bryson, and Rose McDowell's work on Strawberry Switchblade in 1985 is actually secretly very influential. More on that later. Also obligated to mention Cut With The Cake Knife 1989 here. This is an arguable one. It was known as the Sunflower Demos for years before it being released under that title. It is a Rose McDowell album. It though features material that was originally planned for the second Strawberry Switchblade album that never materialized. The mentioned songs were Michael Who Walks By Night and Dark Seven from Bryson. Michael Who Walks By Night would eventually see semi-official release under Strawberry Switchblade Expanded Compilation, but Dark Seven, as far as I'm aware, only exists as an obscure demo from Bryson. There was a very brief period post-Strawberry Switchblade where she tested the waters of a new music career, but decided against it. McDowell's contributions would have been Beautiful End, Cake Knife, aka Cut With The Cake Knife, and Sixty Cowboys. All of those eventually, more or less, emerged on this album. The Jolene cover was also likely intended for the second album at one point, but there ended up being no second album. Cut with the Cake Knife also includes a cover of BOC's Don't Fear the Reaper, Blue Oyster Cult mentioned. So Strawberry Switchblade was over by 1985, right? Technically, yes, in Europe it was, but not in Japan. It uh, gets complicated here. The reason Strawberry Switchblade technically continued until 1986 was due to the Japanese music market. Strawberry Switchblade was treated very well in Japan, in a business sense that is. Back then it was assumed anything English-speaking acts or celebrities did in Japan, usually for money like commercials, would not exist outside of Japan. 
The most famous example of this is Charles Bronson's ads for the Cologne Mandem, which were never supposed to see the light of day outside Japan. Endearingly sincere in how much unfiltered machismo they are trying to sell by using Jerry Wallace's Lovers of the World. Ironically, selling on the masculine opposite of what Strawberry Switchblade was supposed to sell on the same method. Through the 1970s to late 1980s, English, Irish, and Scottish New Wave or pop acts, the New Romantic Bohemian art scene, sold well in the Japanese market, coinciding with the second J-pop explosion, new music and city pop, and the rise of New Age and Ambient in Japan as well. This was mostly due to, at first, David Bowie, but others such as the New Wave art rock group Japan claimed their Japanese fan club had 30,000 members before they even toured the country. The number is slightly suspect and often without a source, but it was beyond just the name. It had to do with the visual elements and fashion. Musicians like Bowie and Japan were influenced by Japanese styles, which were in turn influenced by Victorian and neo-romantic art from the British Isles, the so-called Anglo-Japanese style. Derived from artists like Whistler, Rossetti, Beardsley, Syme, and even events like the Glasgow Exhibition. Often, these maintained a fusion of Romantic, Celtic, Renaissance, Japanese theater, intricate outfits, bright colors, and pale faces with intricate, usually dark, makeup like Kabuki. Does this sound like anyone else? Fashion encyclopedias will always mention David Bowie, David Sylvian, Japan, Spandau Ballet, and Duran Duran influence on Japanese pop rock, but Strawberry Switchblade is always absent. Ignorance or exclusion? It is an old argument about the band on the English internet. Was Strawberry Switchblade that influential in Japan? Yes, to a degree. Research can conclude this. Strawberry Switchblade was influential in Japan through the strangest avenues. Strawberry Switchblade technically survived longer in Japan due to two singles, Ecstasy and I Can Feel. Ecstasy was Strawberry Switchblade's equivalent to Bronson's Mandem ads. The song was actually a commercial jingle, originally totally unconnected to Bryson, McDowell, or even David Motion. The music written by Ray Barnes and Daisuke Noe, then given to Strawberry Switchblade to write the lyrics for, for a paycheck. It was written for a car commercial, the 1985 Subaru Rex Combi specifically. Bryson and McDowell infamously hated this jingle because the music was largely not written by them. It was a cheesy commercial jingle, and it was, of course, a car commercial. Ironically, the average Japanese person is most likely to remember Strawberry Switchblade for this jingle and the commercial. The song eventually appeared in English as Ecstasy, Apple of My Eye, but McDowell is not really sure how it got that title. Apple of My Eye? Where did that come from? It was nothing to do with me. The song was called Ecstasy, that was part of the joke. They don't know what I'm talking about, but I know what I'm talking about. Some people will know, some people won't know. Get it? Then, I Can Feel, 1986, was, according to McDowell, finished by her for sale in Japan after the original duo had split. Maybe for contractual obligations, maybe for testing the waters, and maybe it was connected to a group McDowell briefly formed in Japan called Candy Cane. They never released anything under that name. There's little proof this group even actually existed, though McDowell was active in Japan for a while post Strawberry Switchblade. To some degree, as mentioned, Strawberry Switchblade appeared at the right time to move into a growing niche. The rock band Zelda, no relation to the game series despite occasionally using similar fonts, they were named after Zelda Fitzgerald, had already established a space for post-punk new wave girls units in Japan. While mostly lacking the visual element, though it is arguable, Zelda created the taste for the post-punk new wave psychedelic hodgepodge Strawberry Switchblade would touch on in their brief career in Japan. SSB, though, had a visual appeal to the image, no doubt due to the photos taken by Peter MacArthur, with Bryson and McDowell crediting cartoon characters like Wendy the Witch and Casper the Ghost for their appeal ah, on TV. Casper the Friendly Ghost and yeah. Batman. Good. Is that when you were growing up in Glasgow? Yeah. Don't you think Rose looks like Casper the Friendly Ghost today? That's not really Batman. <laughs> <laughs> no, Rose. <laughs> that was yesterday. Did you have pictures of Batman? Oh, I've still got one in my wall. Is that a life size poster? Robin. Yeah, that sort of stuff, yeah. Pal, yeah. And who do you like? Um, I liked Casper, the friendly ghost, and I liked Tom and Jerry. Oh, there was a great, there was a great one like Wendy the Witch and Little Dot. Yeah. Do it all here. She was great. Everything <laughs> she had was covered in dot. Do you get much time to watch television these days? Not a lot, but we try. No, to. the only cartoon I watch now is mm, what's it called? <laughs> <laughs> <Take it. laughs> 
blankly. Oh, you've got a splicing cat. <laughs> uh, Danger, Danger Mouse. Danger Mouse. Danger Mouse, that's the one. Yes. She looks at me. So... <laughs> well, I just think... Well, you, like you two characters. could almost be cartoon characters. Yeah, I think we are cartoon characters come to life. Don't be <laughs> cheeky. <laughs> <laughs> The duo causing a brief fad for flamenco dresses in Japan among young girls, though it encouraged at least one Japanese woman enough, according to this blog post, to learn Spanish and move to Spain as a flamenco dancer. Warner Brothers Japan announced their intentions to the group to promote them heavily in Japan, but this largely fell through due to Jill Bryson's agoraphobia preventing regular travel to Japan and touring to places as distant as Hong Kong, though by the point this decision was reached, the band was essentially split already. Ryuichi Sakamoto of Yellow Magic Orchestra, himself famously connected to both David Bowie and David Sylvian, was at one point even tapped to produce the Never Was second Strawberry Switchblade album. This would have been very interesting and honestly appropriate, as David Motion had been heavily influenced by Sakamoto's earlier group Yellow Magic Orchestra. Honestly, beside a few interviews with Strawberry Switchblade and Associates, there's little solid details about these talks, but the story is consistent enough that at least a dinner with Ryuichi Sakamoto seems to have happened at some point in Japan. There's a reason Strawberry Switchblade are known as Mizu Tamajin on the Japanese internet, literally polka dot people. Jill Bryson and Rose McDowell were still receiving noticeable royalties from Japan well into the 2000s due to re-releases. Notoriously, their style, well not the cause of, was obviously influential on multiple strains of Japanese street fashion post-1985, as a Japanese blog from 2009 states, the fashion of Jill and Rose of Strawberry Switchblade can be described as the original Gothic Lolita. At the time, there was no such term. Beside connections to that Gothic Lolita fashion sense, Japanese musicians still reference Jill Bryson and Rose McDowell occasionally, since Yesterday, Japanese title Futari no Yesterday, is considered one of those 1980s songs in Japan, with nostalgic covers by artists such as Hinano Yoshikawa throughout the 1990s. Japanese songstress Tomoko Kawase, stage name Tommy February 6, or February 6, covered Since Yesterday in 2001, and her music video Strawberry Cream Soda Pop pays direct homage to Strawberry Switchblade's Since Yesterday, directed by Tim Pope. Interestingly, J-pop idol Ann Lewis would basically absorb most of Strawberry Switchblade's energy and popularity in Japan post-1985-1986, until her own first retirement in 1999. Very obscure in English, but Anne Lewis, despite largely ceasing activity by the late 1990s, with a brief comeback in the mid-2000s, is still incredibly popular in Japan. In the 1970s, Anne Lewis was more or less something like an easy-listening lounge singer with her sound derived from 1960s Japanese group sounds, or GS music. See her hit Goodbye My Love, which is a saccharine pop ballad typical for the time. It's not particularly unique. By the 1980s though, Lewis's style would shift more towards J-pop and rock music, eventually being known for her ostentatious glam rock outfits on stage. There was a sort of simultaneous invention going on between Ann Lewis and Strawberry Switchblade in the early 1980s. Music-wise though, both were very distinct, Strawberry Switchblade being considered neo-acoustic in Japan. They were so visually similar though, Strawberry Switchblade and Ann Lewis are still mentioned in tandem with each other in Japanese discussion. One modern Japanese internet commenter calling Strawberry Switchblade a double Ann Lewis on a certain text board. In another odd parallel, Ann Lewis also began to suffer panic attacks, similar to Jill Bryson, which forced her to retire first in 1999. Both Strawberry Switchblade and Ann Lewis leaving their mark on Japanese culture and later internet culture, by indirectly inspiring the visual direction of series like Bubblegum Crisis and music videos. The combination of what, producer David Motion called, cute and slightly dangerous. David Motion himself has noted several times, he has been particularly sought out by Japanese acts because of his connection to Strawberry Switchblade, both the band and the 1985 album. The synth sound motion baked into the album, particularly in demand by the Japanese music business from the late 1990s to early 2000s. Work of random note by him in Japan, motion produced Yase no Tulip from Memoir Yusa in 1995, and arranged multiple songs for pop star Chara throughout the 1990s. Then motion also contributed to the Mother OST, 1989, yes, that Mother OST, Being Friends, The Paradise Line, and All That I Needed Was You. So there's a sort of a hipster Ouroboros right there, 
the aesthetic, music, and lyrics all had their own appeal across Japan. Influential enough, David Motion was even influential across Japan. Point here, Strawberry Switchblade was popular enough in Japan, it got one of their producers a career in the country. The strangest Strawberry Switchblade factoid, though, is probably the group's connection to the 1986 World Cup in Japan. This is not a joke, but it seems to be an obscure meme in Japan, honestly. It is brought up whenever Strawberry Switchblade is mentioned on the Japanese internet, mostly on text boards. The claim, let her go, was used in soccer montages slash compilations by NHK, Japanese Broadcasting Corporation, for the 1986 World Cup. It was used in Japan for Argentinian Diego Maradona's Hand of God goal and Goal of the Century. People in Japan then associate Maradona with Strawberry Switchblade due to NHK's soccer slash football slash soccer montages. See here, these girls remind me of Maradona at the World Cup in Mexico. So was this real, or is it actually a joke? It would not be surprising as Strawberry Switchblade's music was licensed very loosely in Japan and likely to a lot of different places. Besides mentions from 5 Channel Mirror sites, there's also this blog post from 2003, 21 years ago now, that goes into it. And what I really wanted to hear was Let Her Go. This song was used as the ending song for the compilation NHK produced for the 1986 Soccer World Cup in Mexico. Well, I must be the only person in the world who remembers such a thing. <laughs> the compilation was a condensed version of many famous games, scenes, and gold scenes that gave me goosebumps. This song was the closing song of the tournament, and of course, the closing player was Maradona. Well, I guess this person is no longer the only one who remembers this now. The footage slash clips likely still exist out there somewhere as well in some archive, but copyright probably makes them difficult to acquire as it was the World Cup, NHK was involved, and licensed music was used. There's nothing on YouTube. There's a possibility there may be something obscure hidden on Nico Nico, but it's likely, if anywhere, these clips only exist in NHK's vault, if they were not disposed of. Interesting to note, Rose McDowell is still advertised due to her connection to Strawberry Switchblade in Japan. There's a few Japanese blogs about her performance in Shimo Kitazawa back in 2017. A lot of the signs say, Rose McDowell from Strawberry Switchblade. Plenty of fan art of Jill Bryson and Rose McDowell on Pixev in Japanese too. It's kinda sweet. What else is there to say about Strawberry Switchblade? Well, plenty actually. There's other videos on Strawberry Switchblade. Have not watched them, but they are most likely good. Check them out. If looking for something more substantial or even official, Strawberry Switchblade, in the context of Scottish post-punk, also received historical sections in the music documentaries Big Gold Dream 2015 and the forthcoming, obviously named, Since Yesterday, Unsung Pioneers of Scottish Pop. All these provide more alternate perspectives on Strawberry Switchblade. If you're interested in the band and want something new on them, well then these documentaries will probably serve well. Oh, more? Well, um, hmm, let's see here. Well, only real Strawberry Switchblade fans have ever been to the Strawberry Switchblade Cafe in Katagawa, Miyazaki, Japan. Yes, this is a real place. It has five stars on Yelp, and reviews claim the owner speaks English, health conscious too. Think he is a fan of the 1980s Scottish post-punk new wave group? There appear to be no polka dots in the cafe though. Even if this place was not actually named for the band, the coincidence alone makes it worth mentioning. Has anyone actually listened to Strawberry Switchblade in the Strawberry Switchblade cafe though? Time to be honest. Strawberry Switchblade is a cool name. I'd like to give a polka-dotted spotted thank you to my supporters, Violin on, and an anonymous patron.